Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your boy Mongo Slade. Today we're going to talk about NXT from July the second, twenty twenty four. I'm going to say this was not my favorite episode of NXT, not at all. It seems like Shawn Michaels and company got a little arrogant about the upswing in ratings. They got a little cocky, and they went away from what works. They had a nice little rhythm going. They had Trick Williams as the centerpiece of the brand. He was getting segments. He was involved with uh, Lash Legend. He was the, the star of the show. And then for the last two weeks, they decided we're just going to push him to the side. And the moment they did that, the show's quality kind of plummeted. You know, um, they need to get back on track. I expect, I mean, I know the ratings went down. You know, which was not surprising. They weren't going to be able to maintain that forever. But adding Sean Spears and Ethan Page, two extremely mid-Canadian talents to this roster and into the main event of Heat Wave didn't do it any favors. So before we get into Heat Wave, and we're going to talk about that primarily, and then we're just going to do some uh, NXT stuff around it. Um, we'll talk about uh, other news and notes. For starters, Charlie Dempsey, Izzy Dame, and Miles Bourne are apparently going to be on TNA in the next couple of weeks. Charlie Dempsey and uh, Miles Bourne will be wrestling the Rascals, if I remember correctly. Um, and Izzy Dame will be challenging Jordan Grace for the knockouts title and, of course, not winning. But, you know, the friendship between TNA and WWE is still going on. It's... Uh, it's, they're working it slowly, so that's better. Uh, Tamira Mensa Stock, who is the other Olympic gold medalist, the women's Olympic gold medalist in wrestling, she has been working at NXT. Apparently, she's going to be making her main, her main NXT debut soon because she's already on level up. Uh, her, she's going by the name Myra May Steele, which sounds like she was born during Reconstruction. Why would she pick this old ass Esther like name? I have no idea. Maybe Myra Steele will work, but Myra May? I don't know any woman under the age of 50 with May in their name at all. I don't know any Mays. Um, her gear makes it look like Wonder Woman, which is not bad. Um, I haven't, of course, have not seen her wrestle yet, but I did see some clips of her working at live events. Apparently, she's much better than that other guy. And uh, they haven't they haven't cut her yet. <laughs> so but they also didn't rush her and put a lot of uh, emphasis behind her. And I think part of it of why he failed is because they put so much emphasis behind him and they put so much pressure on him. So it's unfortunate. All right, let's get into NXT and then we'll get into Heat Wave. How about that? Well, I'll breeze through NXT. So Jada Parker defeated Mia Yim. Uh, in a street fight, I was surprised at how hard they went. This was the match of the night, and it was fun. Mia Yim took a backdrop on nuts and bolts, which they're using now instead of thumbtacks. This is one of the many thumbtack replacements. It used to be um, Legos, and you know, <laughs> now they're doing nuts and bolts. That's that's kind of crazy. Next is gonna be bottle caps. Who knows? But as long as they don't go to like glass or anything like that, it should be fine. Mia Yim also took a gnarly uh, jump between the ropes and ate a face full of chair. I know that Shotzi is somewhere in heaven smiling because she took that same bump in order to get a job in WWE. And here Mia Yim is. She's in her mid-30s and she's taking that bump to keep a job in WWE. Um, Jada Parker's finisher is called the Hypnotic. And it's actually coming across like a spear almost. So she's actually putting some emphasis on it. She did this hypnotic into the wall and just barrels through the wall, which is pretty cool. Then she hits a second one in the ring, which again, looks like a spear. And Mia Yim kind of rolls all over the place and she loses. So this was fun. It was surprisingly fun. I can't believe I, I liked the Mia Yim match. Oh my God, what's going to happen to this world? All right, so Ariana Grace is backstage. She's sighing dramatically to get attention because she loves attention. 
uh, Carmen Petrovich is ignoring her, and then ultimately she gives her some attention. And Ariana Grace is talking about how she's from Toronto and she won't be able to go to Heat Wave because Soul Ruka beat her in the match last week, snatched her soul, and broke her heart. And she wants to go and perform in front of her hometown fans in Toronto. And then it's revealed that Carmen Petrovich is also from Toronto. To which Ariana Gray says, I I'm sorry, but you're not as Canadian as I am. And huge pop. Big pop. I like that. That was great. So out of nowhere, JC Jane and Jasmine Nick show up, make fun of them for being losers. And then this leads to... Jasmine Nix versus Carmen Petrovich later tonight uh, on the match. Uh, JC Jane distracts Carmen Petrovich, and of course, Jasmine Nix wins. Uh, then afterwards, Carmen Petrovich goes to complain to the uh, to Ava about the interference. It turns out that her tag team partner has already been there and volunteered them for a tag team match on the pre-show of Heat Wave. So it will be Carmen Petrovich and her tag team partner, Ariana Grace, versus Jordan Nix and J.C. Jane. They're turning Ariana Grace babyface just to work in Canada, which is a very Triple H thing to do. But as long as she heals on the Canadian crowd, it ought to be fine. Um, I will say this. They did mention Natalia, because Carmen has been friendly with Natalia recently. And she was like, okay, me and Natty will take care of it. You know, where is Natty? And Ava was like, it's not Natalia. And, you know, there's a bunch of talking about Natalia leaving. Because all she does is post glam shots now on Twitter. She doesn't answer any questions or anything. She doesn't do her gimmick anymore. But not that I care. I don't care about Natalia being there or not being there, you know. All right, um... Uh, Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate defeated Hank and Tank. This match is entirely too long. Smallfoot European guys need to go to hell. Get out of here. Go away forever. Uh, Brindley Reese is defeated by Izzy Dame. Of course, Tatum Paxley distracted uh, Brindley Reese a little bit. Uh, Tatum Paxley is now obsessed with Izzy Dame. Brindley Reese is now starting to feel depressed she's not her bubbly self anymore she thinks that Idris Enofe and Malik Blade doesn't want her around and she says she's going to go work out and those guys can come if they want to and she's all sullen and you know it's sad it's really sad but it shows that her character has some levels to it usually she would have you know bounced back from this but it actually starting to let these things sink in so they're showing growth to her character uh, all right, Oro Mensa is banned from Heat Wave, but he got a match tonight, and it's against Miles Bourne. So Charlie Dempsey is backstage, and he's trying to work Miles Bourne up to face Oro Mensa. And we find out that Damon Kemp has brass knuckles, and he wants Miles Bourne to cheat. Uh, er <laughs> the problem is Miles Bourne can't hear; he's deaf. So they're doing. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you guys watched um, Avatar The Last Airbender, where they made fun of Toph for being blind, but it was always in so much as they would do things normally and forget that she's blind. And it's a similar thing here with Miles Bourne, where Charlie Dempsey's talking to him, but he's not responding. You know, they're they're doing stuff, you know, like trying to give him a pep talk and he's not, he can't hear them. Because, you know, they may, he may have their back to them. He's looking at somebody else or whatever the case may be. So they they brought this into the match because Damon Kemp is, he, he's kind of salty. He's been salty since uh, a couple of weeks ago where Charlie Dempsey started getting on his case. So now he's salty. So he figured he was going to help Miles Bourne. He breaks out the brass knuckles and he's waving them. And he's telling Miles Bourne, to get to take the brass knuckles from him. Like he tried to give it to him, but he's in the middle of the match and the guy's deaf. He can't hear him. So he comes into the corner. He starts banging. the, the <laughs> He starts banging on the ring. And eventually he got Miles Bourne's attention. But because Miles Bourne again is deaf, he does not hear or see oral men like running across the ring, kicked him in the head and pinned him. Humorous. Uh, it's like when they threw something at Toph 
and she tried to catch it and it hit her in the face because they forgot she was blind. So that's the kind of gimmick they're doing. <laughs> that's the kind of gimmick they're doing with this guy now. And Oro Mensa was banned from Heat Wave because he keep attacking Ethan Page. So he just wants to fight him afterwards. All right. Chase University will be uh, wrestling for the tag team titles. Duke Hudson admits that Ridge Holland cheated. This hurt poor young Thea Hale who thought that they won and beat the Good Brothers on their own. And Ridge Holland, he, he tainted that victory by cheating. Ridge apologized. It was just wanted to be a member of the family. Uh, Osborne is there too. He's like, I told ya. That little munchkin. Anyway, Andre Chase wants to win the tag team titles fair and square because he wants to prove that they're the best. Therefore, he's asking, well, banishing Ridge Holland from going to Toronto and being with them for Heat Wave. So this is just going to be a bunch of guys being told that they can't go <laughs> to Heat Wave. <laughs> a bunch of people are going and a bunch of people being told, and eh, we don't need you. All right, so the, the most controversial promo in NXT in a while. Lola Vice and Roxanne Perez. Neither are strong promos. Their promo on Twitter was actually better than this. Now, let's talk about the promo on Twitter. The promo on Twitter was essentially the usual attacks uh, about Lola Vice. Uh, Roxanne Perez talking about how Lola Vice does nothing but shake her ass. And... Lola Vice making comments about Roxanne Perez being ashamed of being a Latina. And Roxanne Perez basically saying she didn't have to prove how Latina she is. And they yelling at each other in Spanish. And then Lola Vice says, well, how don't, how, why don't we just do the entire promo segment this Tuesday in Spanish? And that's what I was looking forward to. And Roxanne Perez was speaking Spanish to her. But then there was not a lot of Spanish in this promo segment. But at least it was fun. It was, you know, basically, I'm more Hispanic than you. Um, but which is a, a regular thing that I'm seeing on the Internet now. I can't believe it. We're, you know, Hispanics are doing this now. You don't even speak the language. I'm like, oh, boy. OK. She speaks enough of it, though. She just doesn't use it in character. But Roxanne Perez is not a strong promo and neither is Lola Vice. So we're going to try to get through this quickly. Roxanne Perez thinks that Lola Vice was putting on a facade, that she's a fake tough girl, even though she knows that Lola Vice has real talent and that Roxanne Perez doesn't think that Lola Vice could hang it with her in the wrestling ring, just like she doesn't think she can hang with Lola Vice in an NXT underground type of situation. She's going to beat Lola Vice because this is a wrestling match. That's and she's the master of it. She's the prodigy. Lola Vice says that, you know, she's been a fighter. She was a fighter before she was born. She starts, voice starts cracking. She talks about how she respects Roxanne Perez's sacrifices, but she's never got a chance to talk about her own. And how, you know, her mom was pregnant with her when she was training to get her black belt. So then she got a black belt in Taekwondo. And she was practicing or trying to get it, whatever. And next thing you know, her mom got sick. So at 20, she quit Taekwondo to go work MMA to take care of her mom. And she's trying her hardest to cry. Her voice is cracking. The crowd is into it. I'm like, mm, okay. <laughs> um, so she says that she can't wait to win the NXT title and give her mom a call and say, Mama, I did it. So Roxanne Perez says, that as long as she's a champion, that call will never be made. And that every woman backstage wants to make that call. At least that's pretty good. And says that at 22 years old, she's building a legacy. So Lola Vice then continues by saying that she's the greatest crossover star from MMA to pro wrestling. And she's going to be the first Cuban women's champion. Uh, following a stare down, Lola Vice did a spin punch on one of the men guarding uh, Roxanne Perez. And it, this was this was controversial because of the acting. Neither one of them are great promos. But then you also added the Lola Vice crying. And I was saying to myself, it was so awkward and weird that if it was real, it would fit. You know, like, what would make things fake 
is if it fit perfectly into the scene. It being awkward kind of makes it a little bit more real, you know, because she's talking about something, things that really happened to her. And we don't really know how sick her mom was and, and all these sorts of things. So we don't have any idea how she really feels. But clearly she's not going to break down and cry on television, right? And then I'm like, well, uh, let's say she cried for real. I'm more along the lines of it was obviously a work, but let's say she was crying for real. She has to win, right? If she really broke and cried on television. And the only thing that makes me feel like it might be legit is because even when it was her turn to talk again, she was still, her voice was still cracked. So it was almost as if she had put herself maybe in a mind state that she struggled to get out of. And then also when it came to Roxanne Perez, she was stunned. She forgot her lines. She didn't know what to say. They were talking over each other. What a cringe segment this was. So if it's legit and Lola Vice really was crying, I don't see how you can beat her theoretically and kill that character like that. And if, if it was a work and she wasn't crying, then you still the crying probably didn't help matters. And we probably should have saved that for later. If it was a work until she was actually going to win the title. Cause I think once the baby face cries and breaks down and starts talking about their backstory and all that kind of stuff, you got to put them over, you know, um, if they want to have any credibility, they got to go over. Okay. Next. Uh, what we got? Um, Carly Bright was defeated by Wendy Chu in a match I don't think anybody wanted to see. I'm not sure anybody's in uh, in favor of the new Wendy Chu nightmare before Christmas thing she's got going on here. Um, there's no storyline to this either. I don't understand what's going on. And Carly Bright, a thing that exists. All right, Shawn Michaels is talking about Brooks Jensen, basically saying that they sent him away. Because he he's had some problems lately. He's spiraling. And after all of the disturbances he's caused, it would have been right to get rid of him. But Sean believes in second chances, so he wants to give him an opportunity to sit down and talk with Ava. And I'm guessing this is where they're going to actually begin whatever new character they have for him. But I see that this was probably cut short due to whatever they were doing on social media with his fiance. And that thing blowing up in their face and her having to come out and apologize for basically helping with the character and all this kind of stuff. Referring to him by his real name, which was part of the gimmick and all this kind of stuff. Him showing up at indie shows, everything. Um, now they're going to have him talk to e Ava. So that ought to be fun. Maybe they'll drop the Brooks Jensen name and he'll do something else. But I'm pretty sure that Trick Williams owes him for Costing him a match against Sean Spears. Anyway, they show vignettes throughout the night for people like Wesley and Sol Ruka and Oba Femi and Kalani Jordan. Um, contrasting the champion and the challengers, Kalani Jordan, uh, an amazing gymnast, you know, uh, finely trained. And then you have Sol Ruka, who is mostly self trained, also a gymnast. You know, Wesley, you know, is known for being the greatest North American champion of all time. And Obafemi, the ruler, the mountain you cannot climb. Saying, well, that you only, you was only considered the best because I wasn't around yet. Uh, then they did the big contract signing, which of course ended in a brawl because that's what they do. There was nothing necessary to discuss about the contract signing. So it wasn't like my favorite episode of NXT at all. It was fine. You know, even a fine episode of NXT is usually better than most. But they didn't put together full marks. They didn't do full effort here. Let's get into Heat Wave. Six matches. Five on the main card. One on the pre-show. It is July the 7th, 2024. Toronto, Canada. At Scotia Bank Arena. The last update for WrestleTix was almost a week ago. Uh, they distributed 8,104 tickets. There's 2,941 tickets remaining. Uh, the setup is at about 11,000. So they sold, well, at least going to distribute most of the tickets. Um, so 
they had 11 days and they have no update so far. So 8,000 fans ex expected. It might not be 8,000 sold. It might be more like maybe five or 6,000 sold. But should be a nice little house for NXT. If they can max it out, it'd be about 10,000 people. Or maybe about uh, eight or 9,000 sold. So should be fine. Should be a nice, healthy crowd. And they'll be outside of one of these goddamn training facilities, for God's sake. Nobody wants to see that. All right, let's get into the card. Carmen Petrovich and Ariana Grace versus Jasmine, Nix, and JC Jane. Uh, this doesn't really matter. I expect maybe the Canadian girls to win because it's a hometown crowd. JC and Jasmine don't really lose anything if they lose. But, they, you know, they probably could use the momentum, I suppose. Uh, but I, I would imagine that maybe Ariana turns on uh, Carmen in this match to start something with her. Ariana doesn't have a storyline at all, which she probably needs in order to get over and stay over. So I'm going to go with JC Jane and Jasmine next. All right, match uh, one for the main card. Roxanne Perez versus Lola Vice for the NXT Women's title. I'm going. I want to say Lola Vice. Uh, th that segment made me believe that maybe Lola Vice winning is the right decision, even though I truly believed that this is where we, where they have been going all this time, is with Julia, and they've been trying to save Roxanne for that. And I respect that, and they can wrestle without the title, but it seems like they want to do it with the title. I would not personally beat Lola Vice here, but this seems to be what they are going for. So I understand why Roxanne Perez is more likely to win this match. But I probably wouldn't do it right now. I probably wouldn't even book this match right now because I think Lola Vice should be the champion at some point. She's clearly been doing much better and she's far more over than Rox and Roxanne Perez. Even as a heel, she was more over. And so she's certainly more over as a baby face. And that, that segment was not great. But I think it did wonders for Lola and to get people sympathetic to her. So even if you didn't buy into her emotions, at least you could buy into the realism of the story that she was telling. All right. So the NXT Women's North American Championship, Kalani Jordan versus Sol Ruka. Uh, Kalani Jordan... Uh, Straight lace white meat baby face versus Sol Ruka, who is mostly the same. From the promo segments, the vignettes, you get the idea that Sol Ruka is uh she she even said like she doesn't play by the rules, and that's why she was a self-trained gymnast. That she might actually turn heel here, or at least try to cheat. Somebody's gotta cheat. Somebody's gotta be a, a heel. Maybe you beat Kalani and she turns heel. Maybe you turn her heel before the match or something. Um, it ought to be a solid enough gymnastics event. Uh, but you need that babyface heel storytelling there. And that's what's missing here. And I think that for Kalani Jordan's first title defense, that's not a good start. So Rook is a great opponent, but you need to have established her as a babyface first. And uh, just throwing her in there with somebody that people actually like, it's a good matchup, but you're not, you're missing out on the baby face heel dynamic, which the characters need in order to develop. And that's on both sides. So I'm going to go with Kalani Jordan because I don't think they would have given her the title just to take it away so quickly. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if Soul Ruka won. All right, last chance match for the NXT North American title, Obafemi versus Wesley. I'm going to go with Obafemi. I understand the concept of having at Wesley win. Uh, I understand the entire concept of the last chance, but I think Wesley needs to move on. You know, in the promos, the vignettes, they talked about this being two years of him being obsessed with this title. And I said, well, two years is long enough. If you're going to keep this guy around, it's time to move him up the card. And he, Trick Williams needs some opponents, man. Uh, Javon Evans is too young and too inexperienced and he sounds weird talking. Let's go with Wesley. Let's try to him. I would suggest maybe Wesley heel turn. 
and have him feud with Trick Williams for a little while. Trick Williams certainly needs to be the, the, the face of this show and the voice of this show and the look of this show. All right, Tag Team Championship, Nathan Fraser and Axiom versus Andre Chase and Duke Hudson, Chase University. The story that they're telling here is Axiom and Nathan Fraser are not getting on because Nathan Fraser is focused on his singles career. And he's cocky enough to believe that they can beat anybody because they're the tag team champions. They're the best team in the round. Um, and Chase University is out to prove something. I personally would probably take the belts from Nathan Fraser and Axiom. And it will be an opportunity to develop those characters individually, break up this team, give Nathan Fraser an opportunity to do something solo, give Axiom something to work with, Maybe even unmask him. I would really consider unmasking him uh, and taking him back to being a kid. But not obviously not under that name, but maybe Axiom without a mask. Um, but I'm, I will be. I think Chase U is one of the most over acts in NXT. You can't really go wrong with those guys winning. Um, so I will probably go with Chase U just to give the fans in the building something nice. And plus, I don't think, which, what can you do with Nathan Fraser and Axiom if they win? Who are you going to bring in for them to work with? That would be my question. Maybe, again, if maybe you bring in some guys from TNA, maybe. Uh, main event, Trick Williams, Javon Evans, Ethan Page, and Sean Spears. Fatal 4-Away match, NXT Championship. Uh, Sean Spears, forget about it. I will absolutely ream NXT if Sean Spears is even close to being the champion. Ethan Page, super mid. You know what I mean? Just bionically mid. I would not be upset if he won because, you know, they are treating him as a big deal, but I would not favor that. I expect Oro Mensa to crash the party anyway, even though he's already been banned, uh, to, in order to keep Ethan Page from winning. Javon Evans is too young. Uh, he's just a kid. They're already putting him in high-profile matches because they like him and the crowd likes him. But I don't see that he can carry a, a company or a division or anything like that. He's just entirely too young and too inexperienced. And character is just not there yet. Vocal skills not there yet. But he is somewhat charismatic. But Trick Williams is his time. I think they. I get that they want to try to hide his deficiencies in the ring and you do that by putting multiple people in the ring. I get that it's in Toronto and Sean Spears is from Toronto and Ethan Page is from Toronto, but we have to stop booking guys in hometowns just because it's their hometown. You know, there was some, there was some things about this recently uh, in Mexico apparently Umberto and Angel put out on Twitter that they're not going to be booked for some of the Mexican shows. And a lot of the Hispanic fans were absolutely pissed because, you know, when WWE went to Scotland, they were booking people like, you know, Isla Dawn and Alba Fire, who typically aren't even used on TV on to make sure that they made that show. And here is Umberto and Angel being told that they can't get booked at a live event in Mexico and they have to apologize to the fans in Spanish for them not being there. And I actually agree, you know, that you, you it's a live show. Who cares? I mean, when it comes to Clash at the Castle, I bitched and cried and complained and cajoled and everything that most of the Irish talent that was or Irish, I'm sorry, Scottish talent at Clash at the Castle shouldn't have even been there. Like they have no reason to even be on those shows. Um, so I, I fully agree. You don't book people just for, you know, that crowd in the building. But if you're going to do that, at the very least, put them in a position where they can do no damage. You didn't need to put these guys in the main event. You could have put them somewhere, anywhere else, rather than the main event. But they decided to put him in the main event. Oh, whatever. I'm going to go with Trick Williams winning. Because I don't think Sean and NXT is stupid enough to throw everything that they've done down the toilet. They did some damage to it by moving away from Trick Williams in the beginning. But 
I think they're going to get right back on track after this show. That fatal four-way concept is no moss. I'm, I'm tired of that. No more of these things. No more triple threat matches. You know, Trick is going to have to get over on his own. He's going to have to learn in the ring on his own. Put him in the ring with people who are better than him. So maybe that might mean him having to wrestle matches with Sean Spears and Ethan Page and those levels of talent because they have more experience. He can learn something. But Fatal 4 Ways, I don't think he needs that. I don't think that helps Javon Evans either. So, But this is just something for the Canadian audience. So we got, oh, we got to book the Canadians, the Torontoans. Oh, you're from Toronto. You get to get on this show. Uh, blow me. Hock to me. All right. Let me know what you guys think. Like, share, subscribe. Uh, the LGBT Tatanka is a DJ. You can fuck right off with that. I absolutely agree with Lexus King. Nobody wants to hear that beat boot robot music. Talk to you guys later. Bongo Slay. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs> <laughs>